Okay, so uh, so my name is Raymond. Uh, I work in Scala uh, most of the time. It's what that pays the bills. <laughs> it's really about building uh, a modern data platform or other data pipelines. I just found this picture yesterday and ripped it off. So, so a lot of this stuff right, that I'm going to talk about is very context uh, dependent on the situation I'm in right now and the solutions that I picked is also situational dependent uh, but I tried to pick the right tool for the right job uh, etc. So small disclaimer, this is my interpretation of the problem so you might have some friendly, uh, I definitely welcome those ideas but at this point in time uh, it's basically what that works for us. So, so this part, uh, sorry this talk right is divided into two parts uh, the first part is mostly about uh, related to the problem itself, uh, the team, etc. And the second part will dive into slightly more technical stuff. So it's, uh, I, won't, I won't be flooding you with uh, lots of the uh, Scala code like I did last year. So, yeah. It was okay. It was okay? <laughs> you're, you're different, man. <laughs> okay. So. I think it's, it's uh, befitting to start the talk by telling you about uh, the company and what we basically do, what's the nature of our systems. In a nutshell, we are B2B. So whatever the shit that goes on behind this side, which is us, versus the customer side, is completely hidden, right? I think this is quite familiar for everybody. So you can, uh, you know, if you have a good tolerance for this kind of stuff. Uh, so basically, uh, that, that's it. So. Typically, right, uh, at least in our setup, uh, these are the components, roughly, uh, that we have already. So the company that I work for currently, right, is five years. Uh, uh, we no longer classify it as a startup, per se. So you can say that um, it's post-startup uh, kind of thing. So these are the usual things that we have inside, you know, probably you, you must find this very familiar. Uh, machine learning and a pipeline, etc. Caches and etc. So... But that was a problem. So, you know, five years is a long time in a startup. So I'm, I'm with this company, right, just for uh, the last past year. And I noticed one thing is that, uh, you know, as the system keeps on growing, right, from its initial stage, where it's like a single proof of concept system, right, it starts growing and growing and growing. Documentation used to be like, ooh, top notch, you know, then over time, it detaches itself, the test no longer tests what they're supposed to do, and people start having their own interpretation of the problem, etc. I'm sure that problem is, um, you know, very familiar, sounds familiar at least. So over time, right, it becomes, the coupling became very tight, right? Harder to debug, not to mention uh, performance problems that it, was, uh, it, that it introduces across the board. And generally, uh, being a real pain in the ass for everybody. So, so I came to, I walked into this, uh, knowingly. Uh, before I joined, I basically asked the, the CEO and the technical director, what state of the system are you in right now? He basically laid this down for me. I was like, okay, I was born to, you know, to chuck up ship, uh, so that's what I would do be, I'll be doing. But, uh, <laughs> but when, I, when I joined the company, I, I told them one single thing is that, um, you know, you know that there's a, already a problem. Right, so you must give me the freedom to come change uh, the system in a way that it's uh, it's gonna help you to grow. Yeah, so the point of this whole thing is really don't cling to a mistake, right? Just because you spend a long time making it, I don't know where I got this from, but I just ripped it off. And yeah, really don't. So the reason why, right, is is um, I've been building data systems uh, for a few years already. And I noticed the, the, the entire scene has changed. You know, it used to be Hadoop, uh, MapReduce, people wrote scripts on pig and etc. It worked until you pushed to production and things were falling left, falling right, and then, you know, and then all kinds of things start coming up. But the industry, right, or rather the, the whole academia plus the industry actually ramped up pretty fast from 2013 until today. In the last five years, you see a plethora, a diaspora of tools, right, uh, things that you can use, literally. But all of them do not solve the problem 100% of the time. They only solve a part of the problem at that particular time. Yeah. 
So, when I jump in, right, uh, the first thing I always do is I have to face reality. So, uh, what I mean by this is that uh, whenever you jump into a system and then help to migrate, uh, not only the system, but more importantly, the team, together with the system, from a very monolithic approach, right, and then start uh, taking steps to break down systems so that it can be reasoned with. One of the problems we find is that when coupling in the code becomes too tight, uh, it makes reasoning very difficult. You must have seen code like this written before, right? So for me, right, the important thing was to assess how much change is actually needed and versus how much change do I really need to do, okay? So, I always like to see this picture because it's like, um, it, at this point in time, right, this whole system is something that's been running already. From the perspective, right, I'm, I'm basically a CEO looking at this system. It's running. It seems to be running. It's not very fast, but yes, it's running. Why should I spend time to, you know, to rebuild it, etc.? And it's like from, from anybody who is outside of the whole system, right? It's like uh, all things look the same, isn't it? Once you lifted the hood of the, of the car, everything looks the same. A V8 engine is still a V8 engine, but people sometimes forget how many pistons there are. Yeah. So, one thing I noticed is that when you start analyzing the system, right? Uh, it, you have to understand there are lo a lot of moving parts inside. But the, the one thing that I realized is that each of these moving parts, most of the time, is made up from smaller moving parts. Has anyone played this game before? I suck at this. I suck at this. <laughs> I'm so stupid that I can only get one side correct at any point in time. But, you know, there are far more clever people than myself. So when you start analyzing this stuff, right, uh, you notice that you know, things, when you change, when you attempt to change A, it affects B, B affects C and D, and then D affects somebody else, somebody else. But you thought this was manageable. Then I went in and I saw, holy shit. <laughs> the number of variables inside the system was, was whoa, whew. it was a lot more than what I anticipated. Naturally, I would start to panic. The first rule of uh, when you're doing a uh, system migration right, is never to panic. You need to, you need to slow down. You need to just relax, relax. Tackle one thing at a time. Because if somebody can design an engine and put it together, right, it's making up, it's, every engine is, this four piston engine is built up from its individual parts, right? If it can be put together, it can be taken apart. So, yeah, the key thing is to doing it incrementally. Uh, personally, when I joined, uh, uh, depending on the complexity of the, of the systems, I typically I spend three, to, three weeks to about three months to fully identify some of these uh, uh, data flow patterns, the black boxes, etc. Yeah, and then so comes the, this general idea. So, you know, designing a system is actually quite hard. Initially, when, if you are in a startup, right, designing a system is actually very easy because the number of ideas you have to validate at the point in time is actually very small. But as you keep building the system and keep adding features and etc., it becomes very difficult to reason. And when a company like the one that I'm servicing around now right, has been ongoing for like five years, right, there's really a lot of things going on inside. There's really a lot of things. Yeah. So, I tend to focus on these few things. I always try to think in terms of black boxes. So, and I always look at the data flow patterns because these are the very important things that people sometimes ignore. I'm a programmer myself, I still program today. So it's, it's very important for you to be able to lift yourself out and then put on a, like an like a architect role or whatever you want to call it and start looking at how components are talking to one another. So comp when components talk to, from one to another, right? they are not doing something idle. Well, you can find some dead code in, in the systems itself, it's okay. But there must be something that is driving the systems to communicate so that they generate revenue for the company, right? So focus on those things first, because those are the key things. Yeah. So the next thing I, I actually will look at is actually data correctness. Uh, what I mean by data correctness is basically how important is the data uh, needed to be correct at any point in time? 
So when you're building a lot of these systems, like people will tell you, go use Cassandra, go use HBase, go use this, go use that. Go use Kafka, exactly one semantics, go use that. There's so many things you have to pick. So how do you make sure that things uh, fit and gel together? It's actually a very difficult task. To, to, because in, in my own uh, personal habit, right, I tend to read the papers first and, tell, and, and let the papers tell me what the ideas they're trying to solve and I go test it out. So typically it's a very uh, long, laborious uh, process because then you realize that the paper, then you start wondering, like, how come the paper did not mention certain things? Uh, yeah, it could be that they haven't really implemented it at a point in time or they actually haven't figured out the solution for it. So they might as well don't say it. Yeah. Right. So the last point right, is that doing the analysis of a system, depending how big it is in, that is under your charts, right, you will be flooded with a lot of information. There will be people that write code that does this and that and etc. But they don't fulfill any business value at all. They just chuck it through. They just chuck it through to realize something and then they close the Jira task. Right? The manager will be like, good job. But it, it, doesn't, it doesn't focus back. It doesn't bring back to the whole revenue point, right? It doesn't do that. It's, it's, if you look at it, it's basically dead code, redundant code. It doesn't do anything, right? So once, you've, uh, once you sort of like figure out how to uh, separate systems and then you start looking at which are the things that you should be caring about, which are the things that you can chuck aside, you will be faced with the ultimate uh, problem is, I want to design the ideal system. This will be my legacy. Please, please don't go down that route because it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Uh, I studied a bit about the CAP theorem from uh, Eric Brewer. Uh, that that tripart tripartite relationship tells me that there's no perfect system because it just can't happen in the, in, the, in the way that we imagine it. So that sort of helps me to ground myself down. Right. So in the analysis, right, sometimes I really give up uh, as, as some of the fellows who built the code, uh, who are still with the company today, they also find it laborious. The things I keep telling myself is that the engine can be broken into its separate parts. And I keep telling myself this thing as I keep analyzing it. Because uh, my tendency is to, when I look at the system, right, I, again, I look at black boxes, I look at how the data is flowing, and then when it's time to decide, uh, because most of these things are hidden within the functions, the classes, or whatever it is, right? You have to go in. You have to go in and understand what is, is it doing exactly. Because why? Because I'm trying to build POC. I have to convince my team that this thing, this new thing we are going to do is the better way. This thing, chuck it away. Chuck it away. But for me to understand that, I have to bring the translation, uh, you know, uh, as close as possible to what they're doing. So this is a bit of like a, like a thing that I always tell myself uh, is that you can't really change something right if you don't really understand it. So this is something I keep telling myself. Maybe maybe you tell yourself that as well. Yeah. Now, uh, so once you're done right with the analysis, you have this semi grand plan. You are ready to tell and then inspire your develop developers uh, to join you on this this epic journey. But <laughs> before you go there. You have to understand where your team, uh, what your team, uh, what, what, is, what is the makeup of your team? What kind of people are they? Are they like, you know, hardcore fellas, right? It's like I go to, uh, I was telling, uh, telling, uh, t telling Tony just now, like when I went to the Haskell meetup group, right? Some of these guys really, uh, I know that they're way smarter than me because some of the things they are saying, I, have, uh, I just can't comprehend. It's beyond me. It's really beyond me. So I was like, so you, you know that, um, uh, where the team is, right, is, is actually very important because they are the guys who will be helping you to build this whole th thing together, right? So you need buy-in from them, right? So, so know where the team should be, okay, roughly. Uh, so it boils down to my own personal belief, right, is that when you're building a data pipeline system, you can never get it to a perfection stage because you, at a point when you're ready to release, right, the moment you release your data pipeline, people are going to ask you to add features going to add, do this, do that. There's really, you don't really have a chance to redo this again, right? 
So the third point is really about affecting changes in a team. So it's like if the team is already a bunch of software engineers, right? Sometimes getting them to change the mindset is really the hardest. This is the part where I, I, I sort of like a, a convince, I try to convince the management that, you know, training them, giving them the time to learn, right? It's actually the correct thing for organization to, to do. Because you have one advantage that no other company has. And that advantage is that the guys are already working in the company. Why aren't you like, you know, building them up, right? Right? Yeah. So, this point is particularly important, is that a lot of times uh, management forgot what it's like to learn something. Yeah, so, so learning requires time, right? Applying that learned knowledge also requires time. To be really effective requires an even longer time. The point I'm trying to make is that when you're building a system, right, you get to a point where the performance, uh, you start getting performance uh, improvements from the whole system, right? The management has this tendency to come in and say, that, ha we're ready to launch. Okay, I'm going to talk to the HR. I'm going to talk to the, the comms. I'm going to release, you know, wow. And then release on the publication. Everything's ready. And then and things like this, right? Then they, and then they forget this whole lesson, this whole painful lesson that you just went through spending months to arm the team with the mindset on how to learn. And then you just rush through. You know, the immediate, I mean, I worked in a few projects in the past in the such that when the system is being released, right, features keep piling, works keep on coming, the, the team quickly demoralizes. Because, um, because you, you, you actually sell them the idea that this organization is supporting this initiative to learn and apply. And suddenly they realize it's just, it's just bollocks, bullshit, right? Yeah. So, so this one is, this is probably a key message for the, uh, the stakeholders. Please remember there is no perfect data architecture. There's no such thing at all. You only have something that works for this current situation. The reason is because what you're going to need in the future is going to be very different. It's going to be very different. 2013, I ran a research center that built uh, a data aggregation platform for Hewlett Packard Labs itself. When we started that project uh, and ran it for about three years, right, we did something that most people couldn't do with a very small team, and we actually sold uh, commercial licenses. So once that was done, right, uh, the whole thing just disbanded. So, but five years now, the stuff that we, we sold customers back then is completely irrelevant. They're asking for real-time data analytics. They're re asking for real-time machine learning, etc. Nobody has figured out the answer to that. Nobody. You can try. Uh, you can try to get as close as you possibly can, but it's really difficult. Yeah. So, why am I, why am I, why, why am I showing you this slide again? It's actually to understand, right, that there are always trade-offs. Yeah. Think about this. The, the technologies we use today are purported to be able to support data sizes of the future. But few companies actually have the data size to exercise or to prove or disprove those wonderful technologies that these companies are saying. But the one thing is very clear is that there's going to be more data in the future than it is today. So if within five years, in my own personal timeline, in, if within five years I've been seeing so much changes, I'm pretty sure there will be more rapid changes that's going to come in the next five years. So. The key point is create a culture of learning and this appetite for adventure. Research institutes have this, the first one, not the second one, right? Developers have the second one, not really the first one. It's, it's really difficult to, to, uh, to have an organization that supports both. But one of the point I'm trying to make here is that when you're learning something, right, the organization must encourage uh, its engineering team to continuously Try something out. Just keep on trying. It's like this famous 20% thing that Google keeps advertising, right? That has been disproved that it's, like, it's completely fake. So, anyway, that's my take. So, well, basically, that's the end of my part one. Uh, I was wondering if you have any questions? Yeah. You mentioned about change of mindset. 
so what was the what kind of challenges that you faced the changing mindset and uh, how did you overcome them? Oh wow, okay. Uh, that's actually a good question. Um, so one of the one of the cornerstones uh, is probably when developers start building code, right? They think monolithically. They say function A takes in something and returns me something. Oh, it does exactly that. So if I had to expand on it, I would naturally build function B and then does something else and something else. So when they start building monolithic, right? They they start. Uh, to a certain extent, they, they, they sort of like uh, build uh, these structures, right? But they don't, have, they don't really know how to take things apart. So, so they actually never understand things, uh, not say never, or rather, sometimes it doesn't dawn upon them that I can actually do function B in a different way. I don't have to be constrained by the language itself. And sometimes that, that feature B, right, has, has already been solved by an open source technology. But because we didn't have time to go explore, we didn't know. Yeah. So it, if you look at the whole ecosystem, right, sometimes, uh, most of the times, right, at least in my own experience, developers aren't given this opportunity to go see things, go, uh, you know, explore. Uh, like, for example, meetups is a good way to explore things. Uh, conferences is another excellent way to, to go explore things and stuff like this. So, yeah. Another thing that I discovered them is that they actually don't know how to, most of the time, most of the time, they don't really know how to use multi-cores, multi-threading processing. Uh, like for example, uh, not, to, not to diss the Python fans here, but Python has no real multi-threading programming model. It doesn't have it. No matter what the documentation says, it just doesn't have it. Okay, so, so, so what's my preference? I always choose a language that has a memory model. The memory model dictates what kind of situations, what, what kind of rules the program will obey in a multi-threaded environment. Does it have data races? Does it have deadlocks, or et cetera, et cetera. So I, I don't really waste my time looking at the others. So, so that's, that's the other part that you know, I wanted to make a point. Yeah. So any other question? Yeah. Uh, talks are actually let the developers have time to learn, to explore. Yeah. But in the real world, right, you normally face a triple constraint, time, money, and yes. resource. Yes. So how even to first thing convince the management that we are keep the time yeah. for developers, I mean the current developers, yeah. to learn what they need to know. Yeah. The second question is that how are we able to speed up this process? I mean, because in terms of time, don't really have time for them to solve. Ah, okay. Wow, this is a bit subjective. Huh? I I guess uh, to answer your first part of the question, it depends on uh, it depends on how you frame the frame the the answer to your senior management. Sometimes a lot of times, right? It's like um, I ask I ask my mom to uh, take care of my son. <laughs> Sometimes I forget. She forgets she hasn't raised a son in 44 years. The, you know, raising a son today is very different from the time she raised me. So she forgets about things like this. And obviously there'll be conflicts. So somehow to draw an analogy back, right? It's like sometimes your, the, the manager, right? Maybe he's too far away from the engineering organization. Uh, and, and some of the times, right? This manager or the CEO or whoever it is, right? Uh, didn't come from an engineering background. It's very difficult for him to empathize with the situation. So the question becomes, how do you go and empathize? Um, my job in, in uh, sorry, my current role, I, I'm quite lucky because the, the CEO himself came from an engineering background. So it was easier for us to talk face to face. You can relate, yeah. So I don't have a perfect answer. Uh, it's really largely dependent on the situation you're in. Yeah. And the second question is that how are you able to help them to speak up the body process? Like, do you mm. actually engage a, a, a sort of like a, a consultant, maybe, or someone to onboard so that will maybe learn from each other? Like, yeah. let the consultant be immersed in the group. Yes, yes. Okay, to be honest, right? Uh, we tried this approach. We tried this approach. So we engage uh, people who whom, you, whom you might have heard of uh, from Odd E. So Odd E, I like Odd E because um, I worked with them before. So they bring in uh, new ways of thinking about a problem and then enforcing you not to repeat certain problems. 
and they do it by in a collective manner. You you sort of join them for like a you know, for a programming session for like five days, etc. I find it to be very helpful for me back then many years ago, and I con I continuously engage with them on like sometimes they organize the agile conferences, etc. We still talk on an offline uh, basis, etc. To get ideas from them. So, but that also requires uh, buy-in from your management. So they have to believe that these guys should be trained. Because it's like if you don't train them, and they stick around, what what does that mean? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So the other part, right, is actually I ask the management to lay off the KPIs. Companies as they keep on growing, right, they put in these things called OKRs, performance management systems, right, and they try to measure certain things, certain things, certain things, and uh, reward certain behaviors, and then penalize certain behaviors. I basically told them, instead of you, why don't you take uh, another, another route? You can still do OKRs, but reward them for learning. Reward them for sharing their experience that they learn. Like go to conferences, share what they, what they learn, etc. That can be rewarded. Like doing a tough a task, right, by using a new technique. Let's say they learn a new programming technique, and then they apply that to the current problem. So typically, it's like if you're a team lead yourself, and then you start browsing their code, you typically will see the change, right? Reward them for that. I don't know what you want to give them, maybe a book voucher or whatever it is, but have the organization reward them. Because, and have it, and have it done publicly. I find it very useful to have it done publicly, because, it, because when somebody gives somebody a present, everybody else in the room sees it. It encourages that kind of positivity. Yeah. But it can't be like a half-baked idea, you know? It can't be, yeah. Uh, it has to be believed to a certain extent. Yeah. Yeah. Any other question? No? All right. Let's talk tech. Okay. So, so this is the problem we actually we actually have. The top one is the problem uh, that we have, or rather in transitioning or not having. Uh, the second one is, um, is my idea of how things should be done. So, you, you know, you always go, uh, when, you, when you're at a university, right, uh, you read these textbooks and they, they always say, oh, the way to avoid technical debt is to make things modular, <laughs> right? <laughs> then you then they show you all kinds of constructs to make it modular. Then you're like, oh, I don't really quite understand what you're trying to, to, to do, per se. So in my problem, I solve uh, breaking up of data pipelines. So that's my problem. So we basically have a da monolithic data pipeline that's typically written in a, in a programming language that has a strong coupling. When this pipeline runs, it runs in a single place a single machine, a single node, a single CPU, or whatever it is. I call it the executor. So the problem I want to do, right, is I want to reach this part. I want to be able to deconstruct the pipeline into its individual components so that I can string them together and they can run distributedly. I'm happy to say we've done that. So, <coughs> the second point I wanted to make was if you look at these two pipelines, right, they're basically saying the same thing, isn't it? Right. Uh, so this is basically saying a D will consume uh, both A and B. Uh, sorry, well, B and C, and all of them consume from A. This is the same thing as function composition, right? It's the same, except that during execution, uh, it might look slightly different, but the core idea is always the same. And uh, if for me, I have a tendency to separate the description of the computation from the execution of the computation. What I mean by this is, like in this situation, right, why is it that A needs to execute together with where B and C and then eventually D is? Why do I have to do that? I don't have to do that. If I can break things uh, apart enough, I don't have to do that. Okay. So, come to this quest of mine. I spent... Uh, I spent three months working uh, on, in the same company on a project that uses the Apache Flink. Has anyone used Flink before? Flink is awesome. So Flink is literally uh, it's a data pipeline engine 
that understands both streaming and beam. So what does this have to do with anything? What I'm trying to look for are three important things. I want the proper abstraction to separate streaming and batching. It is paramount to have a proper abstraction. And the second thing is I want to be able to decompose the pipeline. Finally, I want to separate the execution from the underlying implementation. It sounds like it's like the tech from the future, right? Uh, yeah, to a certain extent, actually it is. So, we decided to go with Beam. So, I should take some moment to explain. Has anyone heard of Beam before? Okay. Today? Today? Google. Oh, Google. <laughs> Woohoo! So, uh, have, has anyone went to the ThoughtWorks uh, talk yesterday? Turns out somebody... Ah, oh, okay, okay. Okay, so Beam is really cool, I have to say. It has three main ideas. API, model, and the engine. So what I mean by this, it provides you the uh, streaming and the batching model, right, to program a data pipeline that can be expressed in these three languages. Well, we all know, if you are a Scala developer, this is like your second home, right? <laughs> <laughs> so the nice thing about Beam is that the model is the same regardless of which language you choose, because there's this, this unified idea behind it. And it's supported on the multiple runners that we have here. So this is the one I use. I haven't used Apex, uh, Spark, yes, uh, Dataflow. Uh, Dataflow is the Google version, the Google managed service of Apache Beam itself. And Samza, I haven't used Samza, but I've used uh, Gear Pump before. So I highly encourage you to go read the Google VLDB paper of 2015. Uh, Tyler Akidao is the, the main guy behind this idea. And it details very clearly what the data flow model, which Beam encompasses, is talking about. So, why Beam? So, I always like to break things down. Beam gives me four ideas to break things down. It tells me, basically, what results I want to calculate. Where in the event time are these results calculated? So, when in the processing time, right? Event time is literally when uh, the time that this event was generated. It could be at a customer site, like in our case, customers generate those events. Sometimes they don't tag uh, those events with a timeline or timestamp. Some they, sometimes they do. So the other way is actually, so the other point was actually how do these re, uh, sort of refinements or results relate? Basically, it's talking about watermarks. If data arrives be, be a, a past a time, what do I do with the elements that arrive late? Now, the, the general idea, right, okay, in my understanding is this. A batch, when you're processing batch data, a batch is nothing more than a window of a stream. If you think about it, there's no difference. There's no difference in it. When you're processing batch data, you're simply taking a window of the data you're processing. In Scala parlance, right, it's like lists of some elements and you say dot sliding. You're creating windows. You're already creating windows. Stream is a batch with a size of one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And, and I like the fact that the same idea, right, is actually done properly uh, for all the languages that Beam supports. Which means that uh, you have one unified model to reason about the pipeline you're building. It's very important that you're on the same page in terms of terminology. Right? Right? I mean, if you build data pipeline before, right, you always argue, uh, what is in your opinion, uh, event time, processing time? How do I assign event time, processing time? And there will be like a group of five people arguing, oh, we should do it here, we should do it there, etc. There's no standardized terminology. So Google has solved the problem. It basically tells us, this is how we think of it. Here's a framework that manifests our thinking. Please use it. So, now why am I showing you this line? It's because I used Flink before. And that's the Beam API. They look remarkably similar. Now, they are color-coded uh, intentionally. It relates to these four ideas. What, where, when, and how. In the Flink API, right, this is how they sort of relate to one another. You are basically creating windows 
And this whole thing can be translated into a beam equivalent. Yeah. And that's and I'm just trying to draw uh, you know the semblance between these two. Yeah. So twenty so when um, the point I wanted to make next was uh, um, this was done in 2016. 2018 is a very different thing. Uh, you can see that the two models are converging and Flink is trying to find uh, a place in the world and they have this idea of a stateful streaming processing. So it literally means that we can build checkpoints. Uh, we have actually experimented with this uh, feature and it works. Works very well. Okay. So this whole story, right, is that we want to find a way to model what a job should be about. And I wanted to help the guys find the proper abstraction to build a data pipeline, to contain the idea by using a B model. So coming back to this. So at this point in time, we pretty much have decided that each job will be a beam job, right? So the next thing is, I can't let beam jobs just fire any old how. So we decided to do something because I had a lot of time. I had to figure out a way to string these guys together to build like a, for lack of a term, it's like a scheduler, like an engine. We have to build some, some sort of uh, DSL to string these guys together to express the idea of a DAG, of a workflow, right? So in reality, what happens is that this is a, a beam job. It takes in inputs and outputs, consumes by this guy and so on and so forth. And the DSL literally schedules and runs them. That's it. Because Beam doesn't understand this idea of a scheduling. So I'll, I'll come to that uh, yeah, in, a, in a little bit later, later. So at a point in time, I asked myself, do I really want to do this? But at a point in time, there was no open source that I could discover, and that was like just a few months ago, that could do what I wanted it to do. So we went and built one. All done in 8,000 lines of Scala code, half of which is uh, tests, and the other half is the actual engine. So let me explain a bit. So everybody understands a, a DAG, right? So these literally, they, I, I think everybody has done workflow scheduling before. So these are beam jobs. They have a descriptor that describes what they do. So what the engine does is that it literally lifts these descriptions right into its engine. Thus, validation to make sure that there's no loop, there's truly a DAG. And if you're interested, the text tag is I uh, use Quiver. Have you heard of Quiver? Functional graph library? Uh, so, uh, Quiver is a direct translation from Erwin's, uh, Schwisch, uh, can't remember, uh, I don't really know how to pronounce his name, but he's the, he's the um, uh, original author of FGL, functional graph library. So, I basically use. Um, uh, Ross Baker's uh, interpretation. Ross Baker is the guy who is behind HTTP4S. He wrote Quiver. So I use that to represent a DAG and then build an ACAR engine around it that manipulates the DAG to fire, to schedule, and to do all kinds of stuff. So, so these are some of the data structures that is inside. So we have a uh, RESTful API so that fellas outside of the system can go query the workflows. Oh. Did I step on something? Yes, I did step on something. Okay. Big feet. The problem with big feet. So, and uh, literally, it's these are all the data structures that is inside the shared memory. And these are all the uh, sort of like uh, lifecycle handlers. So each of these jobs is modeled as an ACA actor, literally. There's no command sourcing. There's no event sourcing because it's not needed in our use case. So uh, any, any questions? So, okay. So the text that I'm using here is Scala 2.12, Arca 2.5, uh, Cats, uh, as well as Quiver. That's as simple as it is. No fanfare. Okay. So next thing, I uh, just want to quickly introduce the data types we are using. Everybody knows the case class, right? Scala developers, right? Okay. Right. It's too simple. I'm insulting you. Okay, so basically I have uh, only four main um, abstractions. The idea of a job, the idea of a workflow, which literally is a graph, uh, that contains uh, the nodes and the edges that describe it. So the DSL basically validates that the whole configuration is a valid DAG and it has valid arguments and valid outputs. And one is validated, 
it's being stringed into an actual workflow that sits there in memory waiting to be fired and that's it so the patterns usual stuff this uh, we basically use two types of programming techniques inside the whole DSL monads and monad transformers and finally some ACA programming not too overly complicated this is the whole DSL that is driving this whole uh, DAG of pipelines to run. It literally has the simplest thing you can think of, the creation, the start, the update, and the stop, and discovering what to run next. Nothing magical. So this is another uh, simple state function that we use. Uh, our code has no variables. Everything is run through state functions. So, I definitely hate the idea of a variable sitting there that is insulting my very presence. So, I model everything after this. So, these are literally state objects and operations defined over there. So, it's quite clear that I'm trying to bind a Google data flow to a workflow ID so that I can track it across the system itself. Right? Nothing magical here. Finally, MTLs, Monarch Transformers. This is literally what happens uh, when somebody issues a stop workflow. I literally have, these are the either stack transformer. Anybody has seen it? Have you seen it before? Okay, some have, some no. Okay, basically it says, try to stop it and then try to deactivate, then try to cancel if it is a data flow and then update, etc. etc. And this is as simple as it goes. Okay, so just to bring the whole idea back. So we basically have a beam job that is, that is housed in its own repo that understands how to do that job and that job only. Specification is stored in our documentation database. So anybody who wants to reuse that beam job simply has to go look at what that job does, what inputs it takes, and it allows us to reuse it. So the job is being loaded into our engine and it stays there and then you can dynamically create workflows by saying, uh, I read the documentation, you have this, you have this, you have this. I want to create a workflow that does that, 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 that. All he has to do is to submit um, a simple REST call and we piece it together for you. And then at a point in time, it stays in the memory until you invoke it. Yeah. Now, now comes the other part of the question. Where do you run it? I want to answer three things here. Where do I run it? How do I scale it? And how do I support diverse workloads? Okay. This is our final data architecture that we actually have. So let me go into detail, uh, slightly more detail or rather not too detail. So at this point in time, right? Imagine you have a couple of pipelines scheduled in the engine and you need to fire it, right? So beam job by right is a Java program or a Python program or a Go program. The nice thing about Beam is that it allows you to run locally in one of your servers or you can send it to Google and have Google run it for you, right? Because there are parameters that you can pass to Beam that commands you to do something like that. So all this is housed in the configuration for each of these jobs. So when this guy is being scheduled, right, what we actually do is that we look at the compute clusters that we have visibility into because the compute cluster will tell me how many resources we actually have in that network zone and what kind of pipelines can we run. So when a job is lazily being dispatched, before, right before it's being dispatched, we basically ask the clusters, are you busy? Can you do some work for me? If they say yes, we just dispatch. When these guys drop into one of the nodes that is running in the clusters, they, depending on the beam's configuration, they can choose to go activate and run in uh, Google's environment or they run locally in the machine that's being assigned. So how do we do this? We use Mesos. Anyone has heard of Mesos? Okay, one, two, not much, not much. Okay, okay. cool. Mesos, it is the monster that nobody tells you about. So Mesos it started, I can't remember when was it started, a long time ago, I guess. Actually, just a few years ago. A company formed around it, it's called Mesosphere. 
So mass also, the key thing uh, is that it's, it's sharing, it provides this general abstraction to share the resources of servers in a zone for you to consume. It also has a model and an API for you to build jobs that is C++ based or Java. So it's basically an ecosystem by itself. So the nice thing about Mesos is that it doesn't take the centralized scheduler approach to dispatching jobs. What I mean is if you have a typically you have a centralized scheduler, right? You build a pipeline that does that needs requirement ABC seems to work. Then you build another more complicated pipeline that needs A, B, C, D, E. And then, you, and then you have to make customizations to the scheduler and the scheduler code continues to blow, right? So what does Mesos does is that it leaves the decision on how to execute to the pipeline or the jobs that you wrote instead. What it does is nothing more than I need this, I need GPUs, I need CPUs, I need RAM this, tell me where to go. So once you ask the Mesos cluster how much you need, it will tell, and it basically will broadcast a message. The first guy that answers the message literally gets assigned the jobs. Okay, so why? Why do we do this? Because the engine, right, when I was building an engine, I didn't want to write centralized scheduling code and logic to distribute the pipelines that I have that is that is that has very uh, different requirements. Some of our pipelines actually need OpenCV. Now, if you've done Beam before, you cannot command Google to run uh, your job in their environment with an OpenCV installed, right? So what you need to do, you have to fix the problem of providing that resource to your job. So you need a re you need an abstraction, a layer, right? That abstract this away from the developer of the pipeline. Because frankly, from the developer's point of view, why should I have to worry about this? You should take care of the problem for me. It's not, not really my concern, right? So we basically use Bessos to solve this problem so that we can actually, doing testing, we actually run these Beam jobs in our own data center environment. And when it's ready, we simply switch. Oh God, is it me again? Yes, it was me again. So sorry. Okay. so. When it's about to run in a Google environment, we basically switch a tag that changes the runner type. If you've been, uh, if you looked at the, uh, uh, so what I'm talking about is, sorry, is literally this, a runner type. So when we switch the runner types by changing a few bytes of characters, it switches its behavior to go run on these platforms. So that allows me if you think about it, right, I have, a, I have a program by switching parameters, command line arguments, I change where they run. It allows me to do testing. I can install a TensorFlow cluster somewhere, which is supported by Mesos, and I'll just tell it, you go run there, your job, for testing. I don't want to do anything at all. Yeah. So, coming back. All right, so coming back. To this. So, I need to figure out this proper abstraction to do this, right? I want to free the developer. I just want the developer to focus on one thing, translate all the data pipelines that we have in the business and move it in using Beam. And I string it for you with the engine and I let it run a mock inside our data infrastructure. And then we basically build lifecycle management to manage uh, how these jobs behave. Like for example, do I need to restart? Uh, do I, uh, what's the status of my job? Uh, if you're running a Google job, how do I go monitor it? We basically solve these problems at one go. That's it. Because we wanted to solve these problems. If you, if you, if you go read me about Mesos, right? Uh, basically, these are the four main problems that Mesos attempts to solve. And it actually solves it very well. Because I've used this in another deep learning project uh, two years back. And it works beautifully. So, some of the benefits, just iteration again. Uh, developer focuses on building the Beam jobs and string by our DSL. Developer is free from worrying about where this thing runs because we just solved this problem for you. Like in some of our, uh, one of our pipelines that we actually need, uh, I think I'm reiterating again, but in case uh, you, you missed the point, 
we basically need OpenCV to a certain extent uh, to run certain uh, stuff, machine learning or whatever it is, cropping images, cropping uh, videos or images, etc. But we don't want we, the developer to worry about where they have to run this thing in the test. So we set up a, basically a small little, like a very small little multiple cluster machine, right? And then have, have them carry all these dependencies. So when they're ready to test, all they have to do is just, just run it. And it just automatically gets scheduled and then it's being executed and monitored. That's it. How we do this? It's, a, it's an idea of homogeneous cluster. So imagine, so this, this is the three compute clusters that you saw previously in the, one of the slides. So how we do this is basically we inject the job and the, its dependencies, the binaries or whatever it is, Go, Python, whatever it is, into each of these nodes itself. So this becomes a DevOps operation. Yeah. Okay. Are you guys lost? Not a BD, right? Yeah. But, uh, okay. So there's a, yeah, there's a, a fair bit of, uh, actually just a little bit of uh, dev work, that's all. I mean, nothing that automation cannot handle, right? Okay, cool. So, I just want to share some key observations I have. We are coming to the end of the talk in case you haven't wondered. So, recognize, I, I noticed these three things where as I've been building uh, data architectures or whatever you want to call them, data processing engines, but there is no perfect data architecture. Never, not in a million years. I don't care what you try to tell your boss, it doesn't exist. Okay? So, the main reason, always have this idea of change. I mean, you know, you always hear this old cliche thing that the only concern is change. It's true. If you're building data processing systems, it is true. It's 110% true. This last point is actually pretty key. You really want a team that can adapt. Enabling them to adapt. I don't know how you're going to do it, but learning for me is key. Like uh, one of the things I tell my, my guys, right, is that when you start on this project, two things. We're going to go slow. Going slow. Take the time to do it. Do the best job you can. These are two key messages. It's very difficult for them to believe that it's real. It's very difficult. You can ask, you can ask them, they're here. It's very difficult. They'll be like, they're looking at me and then they start started dotting their eyes and then you can sense this eye of disgust. They're like, how dare you lie in front of me? <laughs> yeah, so, but you have to have endorsement basically, right? Management buy-in, etc. Because it, it only makes sense. It only makes sense. Yeah. The last two slides, before I end, uh, references, reading references. Later I'll be posting them uh, to the meetup site and you can go download them. So, anyone using SEIO from Spotify? Uh, awesome, Arun. You're always the most awesome man, man. Always. I uh, highly encourage you to take a look at Verizon's uh, Quiver. Very nice library to do simple multigraph modeling. Very nice. Uh, here are some stuff. Uh, these are the key papers that I used to think about when I'm doing uh, scheduling, thinking about the problem of scheduling. Uh, they are the same guys, uh, roughly more or less the same guys that contributed to Mesos in the end. So these are the key papers. So I highly recommend you read this, this, and this because these are the foundation pieces uh, to talk about streaming and batching systems. And lastly, in case you think I'm lying, go check this link. It has all the parameters about choosing like how big a machine I want to run on Google, what type of machine I want to run without worrying about how it's being run. Google has a very nice interface that displays all your pipelines in very nice colors and tells you about uh, data ingestion rates, etc., etc. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, so, do you have any questions? Okay, you raise his hand first. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, how exactly do you inject dependencies into the Google Cluster? How do you solve you, you can't. You can't inject it into the Google cluster. What you can do is like treat um, the, the VM in the Google cloud, right? 
as um, the preamble to creating an image. So we take a blank image, we put the stuff that we want, we test it first, we cut an image, and push it into the cluster. Okay. So once the cluster, so what you have is that um, there'll be multiple, um, what you call that, nodes, right? They carry all the same images. You can, um, and then you can start testing stuff like this. So, mm -hmm. so um, do you have a multiple images for different types of dependencies? Or yeah. So uh, that's one way you can take it. The second route is actually to uh, look at how uh, Mesos actually tag resources. You can introduce this idea of tags, which means like you can mark certain images to say you only do TensorFlow. Mm -hmm. So what happens right in a deep, uh, programming model, right? Your frameworks need to. Uh, remember, I was telling you about the resource offers for Mesos. Mesos will ask you whether you want this. During that phase, you have to say, I want it, and tell Mesos again. And after that, it's yours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's it. Uh, just out of curiosity, yeah. something like Ansible would work, right? Uh, I, I'm no good with DevOps. If you have SSH access to, mm -hmm. to a node, you can just use Ansible to tell it to install mm -hmm. something. Oh, OK. OK. Well, there you go. There you go. You have already one other solution. Thanks for sharing. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, like I said, the start of the talk is my interpretation of the problem. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any, any other questions? Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for the interesting talk. I love the, um, how thorough you work. I'm just curious, like, during your design phase, right, mm -hmm. when you were considering, like, Mesos, do you ever consider, like, Kubernetes as an option? Uh, what? That, that was really what was an option? Sorry. Kubernetes. Oh, okay. Uh, my my advice for Kubernetes is um, if you have a data set up of uh, about three hundred nodes, you can use Kubernetes. If you have less than a hundred nodes, use anything else. Okay. The reason uh, is I'm not trying to insult your intelligence, your supreme intelligence. Uh, <laughs> is that is that. Uh, the amount of learning for Kubernetes, uh, as far as when I started, right, it's, it's really a good uh, DSL, actually. It's really a good DSL. But the amount of work to get it to do and the stringing, etc. Back then, for me, that was like two years ago. Right? It was like too much work. I couldn't justify it to launch a 20-node cluster. I could have done this with uh, Chef or Puppet. Yeah. I, said, I, I was just like thinking, because if you said two years back, then it makes sense. Like, yeah. Kubernetes wasn't stable then. And also at the same time, like I was thinking, that Kubernetes is offered by Google, right? So, yeah. Um, like it would all fit nicely in that. Uh, actually, I will go with Terraform with that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Terraform is different. Ter Terraform is different. Uh, Terraform is very nice, right? When you have to prepare images, right, for on-premise installations. Uh, the the other thing I didn't tell you about why I'm mean, doing this is because the um, the company or other may have the decision to install our product uh, on-premise. So I needed them to have a generic way of doing something without doing too much. Yeah. So, yeah. No problem. So, uh, anybody else? Hey. What are the response times we are talking about? Sorry, come again. What are the response times we are talking about? I mean, oh. from business standpoint, when we call this API, right? yeah. it, it does uh, NLP or something yeah. in real time. Yeah. Right. So most probably it's because some of your clients has I don't know scalping on use or scalping on earnings on use or something like that. Yeah. Right? So the response time is pretty important. Yes. So what the at least order of magnitude of this response time we are talking about? Ah. This, okay. How fast the it? honest answer is we haven't measured it because we're in the process of trans uh, translating all these pipelines in into the the new uh, framework itself. Okay. Yeah. Is it a note of seconds, milliseconds? Oh, okay. This I have to be true. And this is something for Google to work on. Uh, Google, right, when you t tell Google to launch a beam job in this infrastructure, right, what it actually does is this it packs all your binaries and your dependencies, right, and ships them across their network, which is really insanely fast, provisions a server, maybe picks one at runtime, injects this thing in, then start the job. So, the, what I'm trying to point out is that because there's this overhead of carrying your binaries over to their environment, right? Uh, you have to make sure that the job, uh, the data that you consume, um, the time, right, must be more than the amount of latency that you're going to transfer. Because I can tell you, Google, for some reason, right, 
starts behaving irrationally about 5 p.m. Singapore time to about 6.30 onwards. Yeah, so I don't know, maybe maintenance or something. It's just, yeah, it's, it's just crazy, man. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yeah. In the beginning, you mentioned that there was streaming data as well as uh, yeah. uh, batch data. Yeah. So, uh, what, I mean, what kind, if you're trying to deploy these workflows uh, for streaming data, streaming data typically is like always streaming, always on, right? Yep. So, uh, why would you need to like, Deploy it uh, and stop it at any time. Or, or you uh, let you deploy it and then you leave it there forever. Right, right. So uh, software, like all software, don't work hundred percent of the time. So the nice thing about Google, as uh, as we were playing with it, right, is this: uh, it gives you the parameters on execution wise right, to define a num a bound an upper bound and a lower bound about how many processes or other threads you want to run this job on. And you can also specify the type of image. It's like the size of the machine in the AWS. So this is being offered to you as a command line parameter to alter how your streaming batch job is supposed to scale. So you give it, you know, you give it a, a bound. But it doesn't work uh, like, at least I haven't seen it work like, you know, 24 by seven and it just stays there and keeps on ingesting, etc. and nobody cares about it. It doesn't, because uh, I noticed, like, uh, it, it sort of comes back to my point, something happens on five, between five to 6.30, things stop running, etc. I can't explain it, yeah. Yeah, man. So when that failure happens, yeah. does it actually handle it itself, or do you have to then ah, go in and fix those things? You have to go in and fix those things, right. yeah. So the streaming model, uh, even Tyler Akidao in his paper also admitted that it's not a silver bullet, but it solved the problem of uh, build, like providing a unified uh, model, right? To think about streaming and processing batch data itself. So operations wise, uh, it's largely still like, a, if you choose to run it on Google's infrastructure, it's basically you're leaving your good software in the hands of Google, hoping that it doesn't kill over. Is yeah. it like if someone is using Kafka and mm. uh, uh, structured streaming in Spark yeah. versus using B, what's ah. the difference? Oh, wow, no, that's a big question. Uh, it's actually hidden in the references. There's this B versus Spark. Let me show it to you again. Oh. Yeah. Sure, sure. Uh, go read that. Uh, it gives a much better exposition than I possibly can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Hey, no problem. Hey. Uh, so can I have a question? Yeah, sure. So, uh, uh, so I saw that the RCD just uh, support the Java, the Python. Go. Go. So, I hate Go. So, yeah, so, uh, so I'm using, uh, uh, so, uh, and you are using uh, Scala, so Scala is for Uh, for, uh, for the, uh, yeah. Oh, so, what was your question again? Uh, so, this is this is Spotify's uh, wrapper around uh, Apache Beam. If you ask me, I think better this than in Pardu. Uh, sorry, Pardu, as in it's a it's a programming construct in Beam or do function in uh, Beam. It's it's uh, literally it's a Java uh, programming model. Yeah. Yes. Oh, no. Oh, so here's the thing. Because the team's makeup is very diverse, so I need to find something. Like, that's, that's another decision we have to make, is that when you're building an, an abstraction, right? what I'm looking out for is the right abstraction. The language that it runs in sometimes may not matter, because some of these like uh, pipelines right, are really trivial. They're embarrassingly parallel. You don't have to learn how to write Scala in order to use it. But if the same model right, can be fulfilled by, let's say, Beam, by writing a simpler version, like in, in Python, which Beam supports, then you should go for it because it's a rational decision to do. Yeah. You don't have to do Scala for everything. Yeah. I mean, it pains me to say that, but no, you don't have to. Yeah. <laughs>
kind of developer experience yeah. do they have? So, for example, like, I don't know, this is a very silly thing to do, but yeah. sometimes you need to debug something. Yeah. Right? So how, how does that work in this entire thing? Uh, you mean from debugging? So uh, I sort of can't imagine how you mm. debug one concrete, I don't know, stage in it, right? Yep. But then how would you make sure that your you know, entire, entire thing makes sense? Ah, okay. So, so the integration testing. Yeah. Right? So the, the basic thing is like, once you've identified what your pipeline should do and you've broken down into stages, right? All the developers have to agree that the input is what and the output and you ingest my input and then etc. So these input and outputs, right, we have chosen them to be on cloud storage, Google Cloud Storage for now. But because we have uh, sort of taken, uh, abstracted away about input and output, we can literally replace them with any data store that we want. So it's basically type level. Right? Yeah. yeah. So the, the, the most basic of types is the string, the stringification. No, I mean, yeah. I, know, I, I, know. I can process string in different you know, sort of yeah. flavors. I can split it, I can yep. split it on different characters and so on. So uh, yeah. Is it like, the trivial example would be I have a stage that splits by quotes, yep. or a stage that splits by something else. Commas, right? Yep. So how do you make sure that you construct your uh, string splitting uh, pipeline that oh. you, know, you actually use the right stages from the library. You plug them in together. Uh, it, it, it's sort of like mm. it makes sense to use type C yep. to make sure that they play together nicely. But yep. internal implementations might be different. So it's uh, something like mm. you know, integration sort of level, oh, integration okay. test level. Something. So if you ask me, right, most of the time, if, uh, it's like if you are used to writing the Scala way, the, the SEIO is actually how you imagine you will write it in, in Scala. It's the same in SEIO. SEIO takes care of the splitting of stuff for you. So that's a nice part about, about translating ideas. But it's like if, if a job is too big to be processed, right, we typically like, like what we've been doing in the, in the integration testing is that we write some sample output and then we basically, you know, use that set a later stage, right? And then to read in the data itself. Mm -hmm. So the nice thing about data flow, sorry, data flow model versus Flink, right? They all operate on keys and values. Mm -hmm. It's all like this grouping by keys and grouping by values. So if you're used to Spark's idea about grouping, the beam thing will translate quite naturally. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure whether I'm answering your question. More or less. I think my okay. question is too, too, too big to, um, to be answered in one way. Okay. Thank you. Very kind. <laughs> You're welcome. Hey, Arun, you have a question? Hey, man. Quick thought and good work on the video. Thanks, man. Uh, good to see you. <laughs> see you too. Uh, I have a couple of questions. One is that so you mentioned that uh, the, the libraries are actually bundled along with the image itself. So mm. the one talking, yes. Is so one thing which I wanted to, and, and I saw from your constructs on, on the workflow uh, that you're trying to deploy, that you're trying to kick off a, a, a beam job at all. Yeah. Right? What, uh, one thing uh, before that, uh, on, on the other side of it, is it going to be a separate cluster? That's one thing. And what are the, co uh, what are the co parameters that you're passing as part of the workflow in order to actually kick off the job? Uh, because it's, ah. And what are you actually taking off? That part, of the, that part is not in the presentation. Well. Yes, correct. It's intentional. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so let me answer your question, uh, the first question first. So uh, the, uh, it's literally an ARCA FSM that is running each of these jobs. But these jobs, right, are, are not like, uh, I don't launch like AB, oh, sorry, sorry. did I say shit? Wait, I did. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry. So, uh, when I, when I uh, ingest the workflow A, B, C, and D, I only launch whatever is needed at a point in time. So, there will be one uh, FSM uh, for A. B and C are only there in the configuration. They're never realized as an actor until the point they complete, or uh, that's where the other part of the in, uh, presentation is linked to this idea of mapping uh, the states in Google Beam, uh, sorry, Apache Beam to what we should ingest. Because uh, Beam's uh, states, right, we have to make a conscious decision uh, which states we should ignore and which states we should mimic. Like for example, if Beam uh, job is in an unknown state, we should never, when we are firing the job on our side, we should never like, for example, proceed with the next stage because it's already unknown. There's no point in firing the next stage because the previous is in an unknown stage and things like this. 
So, uh, sorry, what was your second part of the question again? Yeah, the second part is that uh, the, uh, as well the parameters. Archa Archa itself is considered, is it going to be a cluster or is it going to be just in the node? Because I saw Postgres, yeah. I saw you using Ruby. So, uh, yes. Ruby single, single yeah, Ruby is pretty cool actually. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, it's going to be run in a cluster. Uh -huh. Yeah. But uh, if it's going to be running in a cluster, so you have multiple requests coming to different nodes of a cluster? Yep. Uh, Data sharding. Alright, oh, yeah, okay. So you're you're sharding in Yeah, going to. Not yet implemented. Right. Mm -hmm. So now now okay, in which case, I mean how yeah. is it going how do you choose between different nodes of the uh, Oh, I see. Uh, right now I haven't really thought about the pro uh, the problem yet. I, I know the abstraction I want to use, but I haven't thought about that problem. Alright. Yeah. Okay. So maybe one last question? Yeah. I asked myself <laughs> that question many times. And is there, is mm. there a limitation or a specific challenge that Apache B or its program model is posing on? Ah, uh, oh, so, okay. On, on creating this data pipeline mm. that prompted you to create. And that's, yeah, I get it from my team members day in, day out. So the, the main reason is because um, the Beam right, is actually a programming model to handle like a, a idea of a pipeline. It doesn't understand this idea of a scheduling per se. And I wanted to make our jobs, right? Because once we have broken down uh, the pipeline into these individual tasks, it also means that other pipelines in the future, which we are translating, can reuse these guys just by ch altering the parameters, the inputs. That's it. So I needed a, a way right, to string these ideas together. So you, you, you have this uh, yeah. parallelly executable yes. jobs, are, uh, yeah, let's say this e e execution workflows that you have, yeah. and dynamically stitch yes. uh, the data flow uh, as required. Yes, on the context. that's exactly. Okay, yeah. The, so, the yeah, like that. exactly. So the one thing, uh, if you look back to the, the earlier slide, right, it's about A and then there's B and C and then finally D, right? It's a classic scatter gather. So B and C, there's no reason why they cannot be launched concurrently, right? The DAG is saying that B and C, I mean, the DAG doesn't give you the idea about uh, who should go first, not even a topological sort, right? So what you need to figure out is that suddenly I realized that it's left to the implementation to design. And I decided to launch them concurrently. So when A completes properly, and then B and C in the DAG should conceptually be able to launch at the same time. And that's exactly what I did. Yeah. So provided yeah. The, the source of data yeah. for both of these is, right. is already available. Ah, yes. Right? Yes. But if one depends on the other, then this is, this is not going to be possible. Ah, okay. So one thing that we built into the, uh, the, the engine right, is also to track the progress at which stage are they at. And we never launch anything downstream unless we are very sure that the front end actually has completed. Yeah. So that's the basic thing we can do. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I have to admit it's not perfect, but it serves uh, our purpose at the moment. Yeah. All right. I think that's time we have all okay. time we have for today. Okay, thank you. Right. Uh, Thanks, guys.